Last week I brought you a, a paragraph from Steps to Christ, and Bruce held up the book, and I said, that's not Steps to Christ. But this morning, Christ, I'm going to bring you another uh, little paragraph from this wonderful book. God cares for everything. He sustains everything that he has created. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout the universe at the same time cares for the wants of the brown sparrow that sings its humble song without fear. When men go forth to their daily toil as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night and when they rise in the morning, when the rich man feasts in his palace or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, each is tenderly watched by the Heavenly Father. No tears are shed that God does not notice. There is no smile that he does not mark. If we would but fully believe this, all undue anxieties would be dismissed. Our lives would not be so filled with disappointment as now for everything, whether great or small, would be left in the hands of God who is not perplexed by the multiplicity of cares or overwhelmed by their weight. We should then enjoy a rest of soul to which many have long been strangers. So I pray that you will have that kind of peace and rest in the Lord in your life. Thank you. Amen. Let us kneel for our call to prayer. things that you give. Thank for the sunshine we're experiencing right now. Such a joy to have a, a warm, sunny Sabbath day. But Lord, despite this, I know that there are many sorrows and many that are hurting in our world today. And all of us probably could list things that, uh, that are hurtful and, and bring us sadness. We thank you that we can come to you and you can uplift us that we can place our burdens on you and you will carry them. Amen. Help us to do that, to trust you fully in our lives. We want to ask, Lord, you be with all of those we mentioned this morning in need of prayer, help, healing, whatever the need is. We pray for Sabrina and Chandler as we remember them today. Pray that you'd bless and guide in their lives that you would be near to them and direct and guide their lives. We ask, Lord, that each day we might recognize the need of Jesus in our lives and that of others, we might be willing to share with others, and we might look forward to the day when Jesus will come to put away all the difficulties, the sorrows, and the sadnesses in our world and to bring everlasting joy. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, it is time for our tithes and offerings, and this Sabbath uh, offering goes to the NAD evangelism. So a legacy to remember. Charles Marshall Kenney was the first African American ordained minister in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Kenney organized the first African American Adventist churches in the United States. He was born a slave in Virginia, and after the Civil War ended, Kinney accepted the Advent message and became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1878. He worked as a pastor, evangelist, and lecturer in several states. His work was very fruitful, and he is considered by many to be the founder of Black Adventism. The General Conference leadership turned to Kinney many times for advice on how to reach African-American brothers and sisters for Jesus Christ. February is Black History Month. We celebrate the achievements of our brothers and sisters in faith. This Sabbath, our offering goes to support new church plants across the North American division. Let us cherish the legacy of our spiritual forefathers, such as Charles Marshall Kenny, and give generously. So let's, uh, deacons, will you please stand? Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath day. Uh, please uh, be with all those that are able to give today in their tithes and offerings. Please bless it and help it to grow and help us to do more church plants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children, it is your turn. It's time for the children's story. So go around, collect the offering. It'll go towards uh, the school across the street. Sorry, my mind went blank. What's the name of the school? Cypress Bend. Sorry. Um, and Abby will be giving our story today.
everyone. How is everyone doing today? Happy Sabbath. Okay, so today's story is about forgiveness and repentance. Does anyone know what forgiveness is? What is forgiveness? Can you tell me? Forgiveness is, yeah, it's, it's forgiveness is um, when somebody says sorry and you say that's okay or you let go of the hurt that they gave you, right? And then repentance is saying sorry and meaning it, right? Okay, so this is the story. The story is called Friends Again. Janet and Julie were sisters. They were also best friends. They played together every day after school. Best of all, they liked playing with their dolls. Janet's best doll had real hair and would drink water from a bottle. Julie's favorite had the most beautiful dress you could ever imagine. One day, the girls had to ride downtown with their mother on an errand. They didn't mind because they just pretended they were taking their dolls out for an outing. But the trip took longer than they expected, and after a while, they got tired of playing with their dolls. Before you knew, the girls were you're crowding me. Get over on your own side of the seat, Janet fussed. I'm not on your side. Mom, Janet's fussing at me and I'm not doing anything, Julie whined. And keep your hands off my doll, Janet retorted. I'm not hurting your doll. What do you care if I smooth her hair anyway? You don't take care of her. Julie kept the fight going. Then see how you like it if I give your precious little baby a thrill or two. You never take her out for any fun. Janet dangled Julie's doll out the window by one leg. Wee baby, don't you love feeling the wind in your hair? Julie went crazy. Mom, Janet's going to throw my doll out the window. Make her stop. Make her stop. Janet felt the car slow as Mom put on the brake. Julie needs to be taught a lesson, Janet thought. She's always getting my things. I'll just let go of her doll and give her a scare. Mom's stopping the car anyway. So Janet let go of the do Julie's doll, and Julie began to wail. Mom stopped the car and turned to ask the girls what on earth was going on. She threw my doll out the window, Julie screamed. I only dropped her as mom brought the car to a stop, Janet pouted. She's not hurt. You'll see. Anyway, you started it. You touched my doll first. Mother opened the car door. Julie and Janet pushed their heads out the window. The worst possible scene met their eyes. Julie's precious doll was pinned under the car's rear wheel. <clears throat> her beautiful dress was covered with mud and her chest pressed flat. Now look what you've done, Julie yelled. I'll never forgive you. I won't. I won't. And I don't ever want to play with you again. You're not my friend, and I wish you weren't my sister. Julie began to cry inconsolably. How do you feel when someone hurts you badly? Usually, you feel so bad, you just wish you could hurt the person back, just like they hurt you. You don't want anything to do with them, and there doesn't seem to be any way you could ever be friends again. But God has provided a way for us to heal the hurts between us. The Bible teaches us how Christians live in relationship with one another. Human beings will hurt each other because of their sinfulness. But the Bible teaches us to say we are sorry when we have done wrong. And Jesus helps us to forgive each other even when we hurt each other deeply. Saying we're sorry and forgiving one another is hard, and it doesn't happen fast. But it is God's plan for helping us to live together as his family. At first, Janet was so mad at Julie, she didn't want to say she was sorry. But after a while, she began to feel very badly about what she had done. It would be hard to admit she had been wrong. Maybe Julie wouldn't want to be her friend anymore. Then Janet had an idea. She would give Julie her favorite doll with the real hair in her baby bottle. It was the only way she could think of to show how sorry she was. Meanwhile, Julie was so upset about her broken doll that all she could think about was getting back at Janet. She knew what she would do. She would sneak into her room and rip her out of her doll and step on her baby bottle with her foot. A little part of her was worried she missed Janet as a friend, but right now she didn't care. Quietly, she opened Janet's bedroom door. Oh, Janet, I didn't know you were here, she cried out in surprise. Her plan would just have to wait, she thought to herself. Imagine her surprise when Janet invited her into her room. I'm really sorry I dropped your doll out the window and she got run over, Janet said. Mom says there's nothing that can be done to fix her up. So I want you to have my doll with a real hair and baby bottle. Here, she is yours now. Janet just looked at her friend. She thought, Julie just looked at her friend. <laughs> she thought about her plan to stomp on the baby bottle and pull out the doll's beautiful Beautiful hair. I'm sorry, too, for wanting to get you back, Julie said softly. I can't take your favorite doll, but we can share her. I tell you what, let's play like we're teachers and all our dolls are students. Want to? One thing was sure, Janet never wanted to hurt Julie like that again. Saying you're sorry and forgiving can make it possible for friends and family who hurt each other to come back together and live together happily again. 
It's God's special gift to his family on earth. He was the first to forgive, and when he lives in our hearts, his love makes it possible for us to say we're sorry and forgive too. It's a gift you want to pass on in your family and amongst your friends. So I hope you guys can get something out of this and learn that sometimes we have people in our life or have siblings or family members or something like that who do mean things to you, and sometimes it's hard to, to forgive them, right? But, you know, Jesus forgives us first, so we need to forgive others too. And there's this really cool verse. I don't know if you guys know what the golden rule is. Do you know what the golden rule is? Anyone? Yeah? Do you want to, you want to, what does it say? Pretty much. It says to do to other people what you want them to do to you. So if you want people to be nice to you, you should be nice to them first, right? So um, let's have a before we go back to your seats, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for waking us up this morning, and thank you for the Sabbath. Please help us to learn how to say we're sorry when we do something that's wrong, and help us to learn how to uh, forgive people that have done things wrong to us too. Thank you for being the person who forgives us first. And in your name we pray, amen. You can go back to your seats. Uh, the song I chose today is Give Them All to Jesus. Are you tired of chasing pretty rainbows? Are you tired of spinning round and round? Wrapped up all the shattered dreams of your life, and at the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus. Shattered dreams and wounded hearts and broken toys give them all give them all give them all to Jesus and he will turn your sorrows into joy he never said you don't need the sunshine he never said there'd be no rain. He only promised a heart full of singing about the very thing that once brought pain. Give them all, give them all, Give them all to Jesus, shattered dreams and wounded hearts and broken toys. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus, and he will turn your sorrows into joy.
Andy, I appreciate that song. Well, our, uh, our text this morning, our Bible text, is Luke 2, 34 through 35, which we read, and uh, I appreciated Marge reading that for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a passage, you know, that we see there at the dedication of Christ that Ian uh, predicts, and uh, it's one that sometimes we overlook. You know, we think about the birth of Christ, we think about Mary and the privilege that she had and the joy that she had and the angel visiting her and sharing with us the Messiah, his name was going to be called Jesus, and then and also the fact that he was Emmanuel, God with us. We think about the shepherds, we think about the uh, the, the wise men coming, but we have to be, we have to contemplate a little bit further and think about the dedication when they went to the temple to dedicate him. And so that's <clears throat> that's the we're kicking off this morning, and we're going to take a look at what that could mean for us this morning and how it might apply to our lives. But before we go any further, just bow your heads with me for just another short word of prayer. Jesus, as we go into your word, we ask that your spirit would touch our hearts and to help us to truly give you all. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the verse says, Simon blessed them. Of course, who is, who is Simeon? He's a retired priest, okay? And the Lord had revealed to him that before he died, he would be able to see the Messiah. So he comes into the temple, and the Spirit spoke to him and, and revealed to him that this babe that was being dedicated was the Messiah. And his heart is filled with joy. And he goes, and he, he is able to hold this child. And he blesses him. And notice what he says. He said to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is, a, that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This is the ESV standard version that I'm reading from. And so it says the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now, when you think about the rise and fall in Israel, what is Simeon, what's this prophecy about the rise and the fall? A sign that would be spoken against. What is he talking about here? The fall and the rising of many, excuse me, the rise and the fall. The fall and the rising, uh, the Bible says the fall and the rising. What is this talking about? We need to understand this. What's the fall? What comes to your mind? Okay, you fall down, you get hurt, or, or, or at least... Your pride gets hurt, maybe. <laughs> uh, we see this. Do we? Can you think of any uh, stories in the scriptures where someone had this experience where they fell? How about Peter? You know, remember he said, "I'm not going to deny you," but sure enough, he did. Can you think of any other stories? Okay, Jerusalem fell, but the sad part about that one was is that there was no rise to that one. That was a, that was a forever fall, okay? Uh, if you think about it, that, that was the reason why Christ was weeping there when he was being found or dedicated there. When he stopped at the brow of the mountain and he looked over Jerusalem, he, is, he just started weeping and crying because he saw what was going to happen to Jerusalem. They were, they were going to reject their Messiah, and their fall was going to be their end. And he wept for them because he couldn't save them. But this particular, and Ellen White gives us a little insight into that. She says that the reason why they fell, and of course didn't rise again, was because they rejected humility. They rejected the very fact that before they could be honored. 
They had to be humbled. And so they rejected humility. I think about, let's go back further into the Old Testament, about a young Bible character by the name of Joseph. You remember, Joseph was sort of a spoiled child. Okay? And uh, something happened to Joseph that changed his life literally, changed his way, his whole, his whole experience. What was that? He was sold into slavery. If you, there was a whole book that was written about the life of Joseph. Uh, there may have been more than one, but one of them specifically stands in my mind, and I can't think of the name of it. Ty, Ty what was the name of that book you, we, we read years ago about Joseph? Do you remember the title of it? I have to think a minute, huh? <laughs> it slips my mind. Does anybody else remember a book written about Joseph that goes into the whole details of his whole life? Oh, what's called Joseph? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, I remember it was very good. Yes? That's the one. That's the one I'm thinking of. God sent a man. Okay. This particular book, he points out that day when Joseph was pulled up out of that pit and sold into slavery, his whole experience changed. Now, I would like to think of that day as being the day of fall. Okay? That day, Joseph fell. Something happened to him that literally changed his whole world, his whole paradigm, in a sense. And she says, the Spirit of Prophecy actually says that that day, he decided that he was going to surrender himself to God completely. And he was going to accept whatever God's providence gave him. He, he knew that being sold into slavery was like worse than death. But he knew that his only hope was to trust God. And so that's exactly what he chose to do. Okay, let's go to another Bible character. How about a king, or excuse me, a captain, a captain of the Syrian army? Can you think of any? Okay, Naaman. What happened to Naaman? He gets a terrible disease. Leprosy, okay. And he goes to the prophet in Israel. The whole chain of events. We won't go through all of those. He goes to the prophet in Israel, and the, and the prophet tells him to do something that is just disgusting to him. What did he tell him to do? Go baptize. Go go dip in the muddy river seven times. Completely baptized in a sense, you might say, in the Jordan River seven times. And it was so disgusting to him. He he just wasn't even going to do it. But his friends talked him into it. <laughs> Praise God for good friends, you know. And of course, the Lord worked a miracle on his behalf, and he was healed of his leprosy. Okay, let's go to another biblical story, another Bible story. And uh, we are going to go to the New Testament. We're going to go to Jesus' life. And we are going to... Uh, in John chapter 8, this story is found. John chapter 8, and it deals with a woman. And it, the Bible starts out in the morning, Jesus was in the temple. And of course, the Pharisees were behind this trick, this plotting. They were trying to find someone to catch Jesus. You remember the story? And they drug, as it were, a woman into his presence. This woman has been caught in adultery, in the very act, they said. Moses tells us that such should be stoned. What do you say? And you remember how Jesus handled it, very gracefully. He was very kind to those men, and he was very kind to that woman. You remember what he did? He knelt down and began to write in the sand. He could have just verbally started declaring to these men their sins, couldn't have he? 
He could have publicly shown what hypocrites they were. But he didn't do that. He was very kind to them. And, of course, they were puzzled, and they couldn't understand what was going on, so they began to figure out, what is he writing in the sand? And so they began to go over and look, and sure enough, he's writing their sins in the sand. And says the Bible, I think it's Spirit of Prophecy, says starting at the eldest, I don't know if it's the Bible of Prophecy, says starting at the eldest, they began to walk away one by one. And, and of course, when they're all gone, Jesus looks to her and he says, Woman, where are your accusers? And she looks up and they are all gone. They're not there. And then he tells her these beautiful words, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What do you think happened? day for her. By the way, this woman is Mary. And we are told that, that seven times Christ casts the demons out of her. But you know what? My guess is that that was the seventh time. I don't think that she had a problem after that day. I think that death sentence came to her as a tremendous blow. And she realized Christ had just done more than just save her. He had changed her heart. And we know so because we go to another Bible story. And this time, it's near the cross. It's near Christ's time of being crucified at the cross. And Jesus has been invited to the home of a Pharisee who used to be a leper. And what had Jesus done for this man? Of course, he had healed him of his leprosy. But it's interesting to me that all of Jesus' healings did not necessarily change the heart. You see, this man had been healed and he was throwing this feast, this party for Jesus, but his heart had really been changed. He hadn't yet fallen on the rock, and been broken. But Mary's heart had been broken. Mary had been changed. And so you can see when we get there to this story and we're watching, Simon is on one side of Jesus there at the supper table or at the couches, however they did it back in those days. Simon is on one side, and on the other side of him is Lazarus who has been raised from the dead. And Mary is at Jesus' feet. And she's, of course, listening to what Jesus is saying, but she has got another agenda. She had heard Jesus say that he was going to die, but then she heard that he was going to possibly become crowned, or crowned king, okay? And she was excited, and actually she didn't fully know why she did what she did, other than the fact that she loved Jesus, and she wanted to show that love to him. But we're told that the Spirit of Prophecy, she says, the Spirit of God prompted her to do what she did. In it, I love one of my favorite Bible verses, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Where is that Bible verse found? It's in the New Testament. This is how it goes again. I'm going to repeat it to you one more time. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's in Paul's writings. It's in a chapter all about the Spirit. Speak out because I'm hard. That's right, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Mary was being led by the Spirit. 
Spirit of Prophecy tells us that she didn't really fully understand why she did what she did. But she says the Spirit of God moved upon her heart to do that. And of course, there was no problem because she loved Jesus. She loved him, and she wanted to do this for him. And so there she is in the room, and she has broken open this box of alabaster. And it was not too long before everybody in the room knew what was going on. Jesus is anointing her. I mean, she is anointing Jesus' feet. And then she's wiping, or then she's crying on them. And then she's wiping them with her hair. You see, Mary fell. And Jesus forgave her. And Mary rose again. And her rise was to her eternal salvation. See, Mary's heart was broken with the forgiveness, the patience, and the love of Christ toward her. It melted her heart. It melted her cold, stony heart. And it made her a changed woman. And of course, we know each of those stories that we talked about, the same experienced a changed heart. You see, today, brothers and sisters, we need new hearts. We don't need more theology. That's not what we need. What we need is an experience with Jesus. An experience that will, that will bring us into a living, walking day-by-day confidence about Jesus' love for us. It's not a theory. It's confidence. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Father, I will that they be with me where I am, that they might behold my glory. Jesus is calling us this morning. He's saying, my son, my daughter, precious to me. In order for us to appreciate this preciousness, though, we have to fall. We have to be, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. And for most of us, the only way we are born again that I know of anyway. In fact, the only way that I know it happens for any of us is a fall. That's why Simeon told Mary this, this child is for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel. And just as Joseph had to be sold in slavery, he didn't have to be. That's the way it was orchestrated. Just as Naaman had to be dipped or dipped in that muddy Jordan River, just as Uh, Peter, he didn't have to fall that way, but he refused to be humbled. He refused to say, Lord, you know me better than I know myself. Save me from myself. He had to fall and deny his Lord. You know, by the way, we're told if we will humble ourselves, if Peter would have humbled himself, she says he would have been protected. He would have been kept. And that's good news. If you and I will humble ourselves, before the Lord and acknowledge our need for a transformation like Joseph, I mean not like Joseph but like Jacob, remember Jacob he wrestled with the angel, of course Jacob had gone through a lot of rough experiences but there he was wrestling with the angel and he says, I will not let you go except you bless me yeah God is calling you and I to wrestle with him say Lord break my heart Save me from myself, my weak, unchristlike self. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Jesus is wanting, he's longing, he's waiting to do this for us. But many times, we will not allow him until there has been utter, complete failure on our part, such as it was with Peter, such as it was with Mary. Praise God, though, the Lord's right there with us. You remember when Peter denied his Lord? Jesus did something special. Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter turned and looked straight at Jesus. And that look anchored his soul. Because what he saw in the face of Jesus was compassion, forgiveness, hope. And Jesus is wanting to give us that look this morning. See, Jesus doesn't just cast us aside as worthless because we've sinned. Jesus is looking to each of us this morning with that look of compassion, that look of hopefulness. Will you come to me, he says, that I may give you rest? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. If we are willing to be humbled, he is willing to lift us up. If we are willing to be made nothing, he is willing to use us. Because that's really what he's looking for. You know, this nightmare that we live in all began with the idea that I could become something greater than what I am apart from God. You know? Wasn't that what Lucifer's problem was? He thought he was, he was something without God and he wanted to be actually above God. Pride started this whole mess. He promised to Eve that she would have a, a heightened experience if she'd only partake of the fruit of knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And she even imagined when she ate it that she was entering into a higher sphere. Still working this way today. He still holds out before us something that he can't give us. Yeah, there's 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 a short thrill. There's there's a there's some pleasure in sin, or he wouldn't have any thing to tempt us with. It's not that sin has no no thrill. It's not that it has no pleasure. But it's only short. It's only, as it were, for a moment. And so God's calling us to something that lasts eternally. God's calling us to an experience that way beyond our imagination. To an experience that will bring us, as it says in 2 Peter 1.4, through these great and precious promises, we become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God is wanting to give to us a new heart this morning. He wants to give us his nature. He wants to give us a love for righteousness and a love for our neighbors, a love for each other, a love that will be noticed, like that alabaster box that Mary broke that day. It filled the whole room. And so it is with us. If Christ has touched our hearts and we have allowed him to raise us up, it will change those around us. It will change us and it will be noticed by those around us. The scripture says in Psalm 51, I think it's verse 10, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not my Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Shall we turn in our opening, our closing song to number 461? Let it stand for our closing song.
thankful that you have the assurance that there's nothing too hard for you. Lord, we come to you recognizing that you're the only hope we have. But that's great hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.